Everybody, welcome to Marsden Park Church. Hello. Please stand. Let's stand, sing. Thank you, God, for another beautiful day in New South Wales. And we thank you for the community of people coming together today. In Jesus' name. Yeah. 
from the night, the spirit you made me see. And I swore I knew the way on my own, head full of rocks and heart made of stone, the spirit you moved in. Shaken, heaven citizen by grace and grace alone. So I stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. And I will. Welcome everyone. I want to say don't take a seat because I'm only going to be up here for a short time and then we're going to sing uh, some more wonderful songs. Uh, But it's wonderful that you can join us today for our service as we look at God's Word again in the book of Galatians. And we have a special guest today. Uh, John Lavender is joining us with Karen, his wife. Hello, John. Hello, Karen. How are you? Uh, And they're going to be speaking from the second... John's going to be speaking from the second chapter of Galatians and looking at what it is to remain focused on the gospel. Now, I don't know about you, it feels like we're in a world that it's hard to focus on things because there's so much going on. There's so many distractions, but focusing on Jesus and what he's done for us is really, really important. How about I pray and then we'll get into our next two songs. Uh, Father God, we just want to thank you so much that we can all come together as your family under your wonderful son, Jesus. We thank you that he has died on the cross, that he has forgiven our sins when we trust in him, and that he's shown the way to eternal life through his glorious resurrection. Father God, we just pray that we can be people that always want to focus our attention on Jesus because he is so awesome, so wonderful, and he is the saviour of the world. We just thank you so much. In his name we pray. Amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began was redeemed, only beauty remained, and my orphan heart was given a name, and my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance, when death was arrested, my is over me you have made me do now life begins with you release from my chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully
light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again. Lonely up here. Maybe I should ask someone to come up. Who, who can I pick? I'll pick John. How about you come up here, John? On our favourite foldable IKEA chairs, local product, straight from the store. About two, three years ago now. Um, John, it's good to have you back again. Um, and I guess uh, you know we've really enjoyed you coming, popping in now and then to uh, preach God's word. And um, I guess. People might not know, but John catches up with me fairly regularly to help me and, uh, I guess, encourage me about mission in our local area because, obviously, there's lots and lots of people who need need to hear the word of Jesus in this area. So it's fantastic to have uh, John's support for me personally, but also for the church. And I guess we've we've had you a few times on stage, so I'm going to try and ask a few different questions that uh, people right. not, might not know. Uh, what is your regular church at the moment? Our regular church, and so let me say how encouraging it is to be here with you guys and keeping track with Mark and uh, following things uh, through social media to see the good things that are happening in Marston Park, uh, God bringing people to himself, God changing people's lives. So that that is that is super encouraging to see. Uh, Karen and I, we have the joy and privilege of being part of uh, Glenbrook Anglican in the uh, the lovely Lower Blue Mountains. So that's, uh, if I'm not somewhere else, that's where we are. Excellent. Mm. And most of us know that you're a, a, a senior pastor at another Glen, uh, Glenmore Glen Park, Park, which is yes. a little bit, just a little bit further down the mountain. Just down the hill. Just down in, the hill. In Panther bit. Territory. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yep, the fantastic team, the Panthers are. <laughs> yeah. Most of my family go for the Panthers. One of my sons was born in Penrith, so nice, he nice. has a legitimate claim. Uh, unfortunately, I go for the West Tigers, so I'm a loser, <laughs> but that's all right. Uh, that's fine. Uh, did you know the, the Giants won at the <laughs> yes, AFL? I did, yep. I did yep. see that, yep. yes. And Tottenham are going all right in the Premier <laughs> yes, League, so I there's my that. teams. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, oh, 
Well, that's right. I'm talking about you, aren't we? Uh, <laughs> all right. So, uh, Glenmore Park. It, it yeah. didn't like start off in a, a, a nice no. build building that no. it's in there currently, and with sort of almost like two auditoriums <laughs> and a wonderful space. Uh, where did church sort of start when you arrived? Yeah, we arrived in December 1996 to our church, which was a carpeted three-car air-conditioned garage. <laughs> nice. So, <laughs> that was church for us, so, yeah. So, so we, we share something in common. Yes. We're, we're not quite air-conditioned. We're not. We're bigger than three <laughs> uh, cars. But this is an originally the bus yes. set, yeah. shed yeah. for yeah. the school. And wow. uh, no, over time, but uh, hopefully in the not-too-distant future, they will convert this uh, more into a... A hall yep. and air condition it rather nice. than it be nice. sort of a nice looking bus shed. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we look forward to that. Um, so, yeah, okay, you met in a three car garage with air conditioning. Carpeted. Carpeted, carpeted. <laughs> all right, that's all right. Okay, did you have a kitchenette? I bet you didn't. Uh, we had a sink. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, all right. What a- it was actually attached to our house. Oh, okay, there you go. That's your kitchen. All right. Okay. So we, we, it up? was our kitchen. Right. Did you have a stage? Did you have a data projector? We right? had a raised platform. All right. Um, okay. But uh, Glenmore Park obviously um, grew from there, not, not yeah. just uh, in people uh, and, and spiritual growth, but also in terms of a building. Um, how many building projects did you go through in your time? How, so how long were you at Glenmore Park? Uh, we arrived in December 96 yep. and uh, we finished up in January 2020. Okay. That's so all right. Wow. Well, yeah. Okay. So what happened in those yeah, 20 so years? Yeah, so we outgrew the garage. Uh, we got there and there's about 40 adults and children and it quickly, in God's goodness and con- kindness, uh, we outgrew the garage. We arrived as a new building project was getting underway. So while we were sitting in the garage, we could look out the garage doors and uh, see our new building uh, going up. And again, in God's goodness, that building quickly filled. So we had one service at uh, 9.30 and then we split. We we started an evening service at 7 o'clock. We split the morning service. So we had 10.15 and uh, 8.30, and again, in God's goodness and kindness, he brought uh, people, so we started a five o'clock service, and we just filled the building. And uh, around about 2010, we started another building project, which was a a much larger extension, and uh, that meant that we just had so many more opportunities to connect with people. There was nothing really in Glenmore Park for people to gather so we could have play group, we could have kids groups, we could have youth and young adult stuff, women, seniors. It was just a fantastic space that we we were able to use in God's kindness. And then in uh, uh, around about 2018 or 2017, uh, we merged with the parish of Mulgoa. And uh, there was a lovely old building in Mulgoa, terrific, lovely old building, but it wasn't big. There was no kitchens or space for kids' activities, no meeting rooms. So we started another building project, uh, this time in Silverdale. And and some of you may know where Silverdale is. It's kind of down near Warragamba Dam, if I put it that way. So that was my third building project. So I kind of feel I could help with building projects. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wow, that's awesome! Yes. Um, we, we look forward to our, our building project starting yeah, yeah, starting yeah. soon. Exciting, Ho- hopefully, exciting. I, don't, I don't get three in twenty <laughs> years, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, John, it's fantastic to have you, and yeah. fantastic to Thank hear you. from the Book of Galatians, mm. especially about the gospel. Uh, how about I pray for you, you and also for the kids because they're about to go out to their cool. kids program. That'd be great, uh, Father God. We just really do thank you for uh, John and Karen, and Louise. Thank you for how you have. Uh, equip them for ministry uh, over over the years. Uh, we thank you for their ministry at Glenmore Park and how you use them. And we thank you for um, the ministry that they're now doing and how you're using them. And Lord, we just uh, pray that you would continually uh, bless them and equip them to share your wonderful words with as many people as possible. Uh, Father God, we do uh, thank you so much for uh, our kids. And we thank you, Lord, that they get the opportunity to hear God's word uh, in an appropriate way for their age. And, and Lord, we just also thank you so much for uh, the kids' church leaders. And Lord, we just uh, thank you for the blessing that they are. And Lord, we just pray today that uh, as they all go out to enjoy 
uh, each other, enjoy your word, enjoy craft, enjoy fun in Kids Church, that you would be blessing each and every one of the people in that room, kids and leaders as well. And we just thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so no worries. Uh, the kids are going out. How awesome. So if you are explorer's age, which is 18 months to five years, uh, you could get up now. If you're in primary school, so kinder to year six, you're going out. And basically, you're going to follow Adam around to the demandables, which are over there, and you will have a fantastic time. Uh, if you are a new, uh, if you... Uh, here for the first time, well, welcome. My name's Mark. And also, just so you're aware, in regards to the bathrooms, uh, you have to go out through the doors you entered, go around the back here, and the bathrooms are located in the school building, which is Block C, which is just across the um, Cola area. So um, please use them at your leisure. Uh, and if you're here, please talk to the person next to you. It's uh, wonderful that you can join us. Hello. Today's Bible reading is from Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 21. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then? that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified, in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners. Doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. I might just raise this up a little bit. Ooh, there we go. How's that? I said it's really a joy and a privilege to, uh, to be with you guys this morning as uh, we continue this, uh, this series, this magnificent series on the, uh, the book of Galatians. It'd be great if you're able to keep your Bibles uh, open or you've got a device 
might be, uh, I think it'll be really helpful if you're able to follow with me, but I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this letter from the Apostle Paul, and we pray for our time now. Please give us soft hearts and open ears, ready to hear you. Uh, Please help us to keep our focus on Jesus, living lives that bring honour to him. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as uh, Mark kicked us off this morning, uh, it's true, isn't it? Uh, When we're concentrating, when we're supposed to be concentrating on something, it is so easy to get distracted, just so easy. I used to do a lot of soccer coaching, and uh, one of the great highlights of uh, soccer coaching was coaching the under fives or the under sixes. Uh, I I can tell you, you've been there. It is so much fun. Uh, At game day, we'd all be there at the field, Parents and friends keenly supporting these budding young soccer stars. And I remember the fullbacks. I remember the fullbacks. They'd be intently focused on the game, deep in concentration, watching the play. It comes close to them. An aeroplane flies over. Look, look, look at the aeroplane as, as the ball goes past them. And, of course, it was so much worse... If it was the goalkeeper, you'd see the goalkeeper just kicking around in the dust, (laughs) watching the play. It comes close to him. Suddenly there's a helicopter. Look, a helicopter as the ball goes into the net. (laughs) How important it is to keep on concentrating on what we're supposed to be doing. Do not get distracted. And as we continue our series on the New Testament book of Galatians, This is where the Apostle Paul will take us this morning. The importance of not being distracted. The importance of keeping our focus on Jesus. Who he is. What he has done. And this is why Paul wrote to uh, the Christians in the Galatian churches. False teachers had arrived. They've been spreading a false message, which, is a hu- which has been a huge distraction. It's caused the Galatians to take their eyes, to take their focus off Jesus. They've been adding to the gospel. They've been saying, oh, yeah, look, belief in Jesus, yeah, that's good, but it's not enough. They've been saying that to be a real Christian You need to become like the Jews. You need to follow. You need to obey certain rules, certain rituals, certain traditions. And sadly, the Galatian Christians, they were taken in. They they took their focus off Jesus. They took their focus off Jesus' saving work, of his grace and off his rescue. And instead of relying on Jesus for salvation... They were relying on rules, relying on rituals and traditions. And as we've seen in the book of Galatians, especially relying on Jewish rules about food and circumcision. Now, sadly, this was a situation that Paul was already familiar with. Now, we don't know when uh, the events took place in the opening verses there, as we heard. Maybe it was 12 to 18 months earlier. But Paul and the Apostle Peter, he referred to as Cephas, uh, had already had a confrontation about this issue in the Syrian city of Antioch. And Paul tells the Galatians about this experience, taking Peter taking his focus off Jesus, not just because it's virtually identical to the, the situation that's happening in Galatia, because it's, he tells them because he wants to highlight how serious it is. Now, this part of the Bible, it does have some important, it has some complex, big ideas, so you're going to have to work hard this morning to not be distracted. And as we look at what is going on, it's going to be helpful to ask uh, some questions. Why did Peter lose his focus on Jesus? And does it matter? What's it got to do with us? What's it got to do with you and I here in Marsden Park this morning? What's it got to do with us? What are the issues at stake? Why is it so important? Uh, Paul would say, why is it essential that you and I, we keep our focus firmly fixed on Jesus? Why is that so important? 
Well, as we can continue, can I get you to think of some of the people you know? Friends, family, people at work, people at school or uni or TAFE, your neighbours. As you're thinking about these people, you see survey after survey will tell us that the vast majority of these people, the vast majority of the people you know, even if they don't really express a faith in God, they think that what happens after they die, if there is a God, he will accept them basically because I'm a good person. I help my neighbour. I give to charities. I might make people's lawns every now and then if they're in need. Look, I don't know all the Ten Commandments, but the ones I know, I try to follow them. Some might even talk about the religious experiences that, that, that they've had. You know, they were baptised. Or they went to a religious school. <clears throat> they might even pray occasionally. Now, all this stuff they're thinking about, in their mind, it's like climbing a ladder to heaven. It's like earning flybys or frequent flyer points, but not if you're flying with Qantas. Let's not go there. But, but the more they, their thinking is that the more good things, the more religious things you do, the higher you go, the further you can fly. Now, I wonder if some of you here this morning, is that, is that how you think about things? Is that how you think about life? Is this how it works? The more I do, the higher I go, the higher I fly. And these are big questions. They're massive questions. Questions about eternity. Questions about being right with God. Yet Paul's answer, the answer that he will come back to time and time again in this part of the Bible we're reading is that it has nothing to do with what I do, but it has everything to do with Jesus. God will not accept me because of what I do. But God will accept me because of what Jesus has done. This is such an important truth that we must keep our focus on Jesus. And as soon as you take your eyes off Jesus, as soon as you start relying on trying to be good, on relying on rules and traditions, on what you do, you're heading down a dead-end path, and that is a dead-end path that none of us want to go down. Well, what was the situation in Antioch? Well, in chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, Paul tells us that when a group of men arrived, uh, men who belonged to the circumcision group, and as I typed that, the circumcision group, I'm thinking, what a funny name for a group. I mean, you imagine you're having a dinner conversation. I belong to the circumcision group. What group do you belong to? <laughs> well, <laughs> when these men arrived in Antioch, uh, Peter, a Jew, began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Why? Why did he do that? Well, in the history of religion to this point... Uh, Jews and Gentiles never mixed. Uh, the Jews had many rules, many regulations, especially food laws, uh, laws about what was clean, laws about what were unclean, and it rules that kept them separate from the Gentiles, who sadly they saw as unclean. All this changed with Jesus. It did take a little while to sink in, but as you read your New Testament, parts of the New Testament like Acts 10... And Acts 15, we see how the message was gradually taking effect. Jesus removed the distinctions about clean and unclean. And it meant that as far as God was concerned, Jews and Gentiles were on the same playing field. Jews and Gentiles could all stand before God because of their faith in Jesus. There's no distinction. Jews and Gentiles were all one in Christ. It's a huge turning point in history. And that is why in verse 12 we read that Peter used to eat with the Gentiles. He got it. Well, why, why did things change? Why did they change when the circumcision group arrived? Well, we know from Galatians and other parts of the New Testament 
that the circumcision group <coughs> were Jews. They recognised the special place of Jesus. But, and this is a massive but, at the same time they said that faith in Jesus is not enough. They argued that to be a real Christian, to be a proper Christian, you had to become Jewish. You had to become circumcised. You had to follow Jewish rules, Jewish rituals, eat the right foods, and you couldn't mix with the unclean Gentiles. Now, what, why, did the, why did the circumcision group push, push this issue? Well, perhaps they just simply didn't understand the gospel of grace. Maybe they didn't understand that. Perhaps it was well-intentioned. Um, maybe what they were doing was acting to protect their Jewish heritage. Maybe they were acting to put up kind of like boundary fences, which they thought, you know, if you stay inside the boundary fence, it'll promote more godly living. But what happened is rather than promote godly living, it actually promotes doubt. Because people ask the question, oh, gee, have I done enough to keep these rules? And at the same time, what was also happening was that people began to depend on keeping those rules for their salvation, for their right standing with God. They took their focus off Jesus thinking, God will accept me because I follow rules. Now, as we think about uh, how did Peter <coughs> respond, uh, we know from the New Testament, you read your New Testament and you get a picture of Peter, he's a pretty impulsive sort of guy. Uh, some of you might know from Matthew chapter 14, uh, <coughs> the disciples are in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. They see Jesus walking on the water. Peter, impetuous, jumps out of the boat he starts walking on the water until, until he took his eyes off Jesus and he saw the wind and the waves and fear took hold and he began to sink. Some of you might also remember Peter's bold confession uh, to Jesus on the night before Jesus was crucified. You might remember they're sitting in the upper room, they're talking about <clears throat> the events that are going to happen and Peter boldly declares, Jesus, I'll be with you. I'll stand with you no matter what. I'll, I'll be there. You can count on me. I'll be there. Except just a few hours later, fear takes hold. And Peter sadly three times denies even knowing Jesus. Now in chapter 2, verse 12, as Peter, pressure is applied, he began to draw back. He separated himself from the Gentiles. Why? Again, because he was afraid. Once again, fear took hold and he took his eyes off Jesus. Now, perhaps Peter was afraid that it would look, he would look bad. You know, he'd look bad amongst all the people if he didn't go along. But we need to see the tragic consequences, the tragic outcome of his actions. In verse 13, the other Jews joined him and even Barnabas. Now, Barnabas is one of the heroes of the book of Acts. But even Barnabas was led astray. Now, a couple of thousand, hundred years later, it's very easy for us to look back at Peter and say, you know, we shake our heads and we're critical of Peter. What are you doing? You know what's right, you know what's true. But here's the thing, how many of us at our work or at our home when we're hanging out with family or friends, we do exactly the same thing? That fear of looking bad, of looking weird. We, we don't want to stand out. We want, we want to fit in. We don't want to be left out. So we take our eyes off Jesus. We compromise. We go with the flow. Think about those times too, those times too when life does take a turn for the worst. You know, when life is tough, when it's sad, when it's uncertain, when it's difficult, 
And as I go around churches and chat with people, sadly I see these are the times when people sometimes they crumble. They crumble because they take their eyes off Jesus. Now times like this, they are challenging, aren't they? But can I please encourage you, no matter what your circumstances, keep your focus on Jesus. Keep your confidence in him, on what he has done for you, what he's achieved for you, what he has promised you. Now, as you sit there now, maybe right now, you can think of some areas in your life where, oh, gee, I better get my focus back on Jesus. That would be a good thing to do today. Get your focus back on Jesus. But it's at this point in uh, Galatians reading where the Apostle Paul steps in. Now, let's be clear, Paul's not a bully. He's not looking for a fight. Verse 14 tells us what is going on. This is a serious issue. Peter is not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. A terrible compromise. Actually, it's worse than a terrible compromise. A terrible error is going down. Peter is implying by his actions that the Gentiles are not good enough to be real Christians. Peter is implying that if the Gentiles want to be acceptable to God, that the gospel of Jesus, it's not enough. They need to become like Jews. Peter is denying the truth of the gospel. Now, some of you may know how the story ends. Uh, Not all of you might. Uh, Paul doesn't talk about it here in this letter, but in his second New Testament letter, Peter does. Uh, Peter writes about Paul in that second New Testament letter, and this is what you can see it on the screen. This is what how Peter describes Paul, calling him our dear brother Paul, who wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. Now, Peter wouldn't be calling him a dear brother if there was still hostility between them. And why why I spend just a few moments on this is I think it's helpful. I think it's good for you to know because if you have dropped the ball, if you have taken your focus off Jesus, if you have compromised your faith or trust in him, there is no shame in turning back to God. There's no shame in turning back to God. There's no shame in turning back to God for his forgiveness, because God's forgiveness to us is real. It is total. Now, at this point, as we talk about the truth of the gospel, it's important that we are 100% clear. You've been talking about it a couple of weeks ago when you kicked off the series, but let's just get clear in our minds. What is the gospel? What have we seen so far? What has Galatians told us? What is God is telling us? That is the gospel. We've seen that the gospel is an announcement. It's an announcement of spectacular good news. It's an announcement of salvation, an announcement of rescue. The gospel declares that God in his extraordinary grace has acted to rescue, to save us through the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. And it's so important, the gospel declares that each one of us, each one of us needs this rescue. Each one of us needs to be put right with God. And the gospel declares that on the cross, Jesus takes on himself the consequences, the punishment for us not treating God as God, for us not giving him the place in our lives that he rightly, so rightly deserves. The gospel declares that as we put our humble faith in the finished work of Jesus and nothing else, we can have peace. You can have peace. You can have forgiveness with God. And trusting Jesus frees us from the burden of following rules. It frees us from the burden of following regulations. But not only this, the gospel creates this level playing field where all people, Jews, Gentiles, we're all equal before God. We are all one in Christ. And what Peter is doing is so much worse 
than a five-year-old goalkeeper being distracted by a helicopter and letting a ball go into the net. It's, it's a massive challenge to the truth and implication of what Jesus has done, what he's achieved. And this is why Paul cannot stay silent. The Jewish religion, or for that matter, any religion that teaches you must do anything apart from trust Jesus, cannot claim to be the way of salvation. That is how serious this issue is. Uh, The circumcision group, the false teachers in Galatia, are in effect saying, you must climb a ladder to reach God. The gospel is saying that God has built a bridge for us to cross to reach him. And that bridge is the cross of Christ. All religions talk about what you must do to be acceptable to God. The gospel declares that in Jesus, everything has been done for us to be acceptable to God. And in verses 15 to 21, because Paul knows how important, how significant this is, he repeats himself several times. I think he might have got kind of fired up about it because he knows how important it is. Your life, your right standing with God is always only based on faith in Jesus and never by what you do. And Paul is clear, there is only one gospel. You cannot add to it. To add to it destroys it. As you trust in the gospel, you can be confident you are a Christian. You can be confident that you are accepted by God. You're continuing as a Christian. It's never about what you do. It's always about what Jesus has done. Now, once, this was a huge issue for me. I'd grown up thinking that uh, a Christian was about what I had to do. It was about doing good things. And uh, when I was around 20, uh, studying at Macquarie Uni, uh, learning to be, studying to be a teacher... I was very conscious that a lot of what I was doing, a lot of what I was thinking, it was not good. So my response, I'm going to try harder. I found a copy of the Ten Commandments. I cut them out, put them on my desk. It was a reminder, I must be good. But here's the thing. The harder I tried, the more I, the, the more I was aware I wasn't making it. I just knew I was not good enough and I was full of fear. I was full of guilt. I tried harder. Made no difference. And I felt terrible. And I ended up thinking, if this is what it means to be a Christian, being good, it is impossible. So I made a conscious, deliberate decision and I chucked it in. Now, that continued for quite a while until I met some uh, more friends at uni who gave me a Bible. They sat down and spent time with me, listened and talked with me to help me understand exactly what Paul is talking about in the part of the Bible that we're looking at this morning. A Christian is never about having faith in what I do. A Christian is always about having faith in what Jesus has done. If I have faith in what I do, I can never be sure. I can never be certain, have I done enough? But if my faith, if my focus in Jesus, I can be confident because I can know that Jesus has done it all. Now in my 20s, and to this day still, Knowing this, it is liberating. It is freeing. It is life-changing. And I'm going to ask you this morning, do you know that? Do you know that experience? Can you say, yes, this is true for me. I know the difference that Jesus makes. If you're not sure, have a chat to me after. Catch up with Mark as well. This is exactly what Paul is talking about in this part of the Bible. See what he says in verse 16. I know that a person is not justified by works of the law, 
but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by sorry be justified by faith in Jesus in Christ and not by works of the law because by works of the law no one will be justified. Justified is one of those big important words in the Bible and Paul's so wound up about this. He uses it three times to emphasize his point. What he's saying is that God declares me the unjustifiable, not guilty. God accepts me. Not because of anything I've done, what Paul calls works of the law, he accepts me because of what Jesus has done. The gospel pushes me away from our works, which can never be enough, and points us to the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And see how the gospel it takes away any hint of self-righteousness, It takes away any hint of pride and the gospel completely changes the way we see other people. The gospel pushes me to see that we're all, all people, we're all in desperate need of rescue. doesn't matter who we are, rich, poor, male, female, young, old, we're all in the same boat. None of us can claim to be good enough for God But the gospel declares that in Jesus, a door has been opened so that all who put their faith in Christ may come in. People who live with... uh, This is a magnificent message of hope. It's a magnificent message of liberation for people struggling with the pressures and burdens of life. People who live without joy, with hope. We can point them... What an appropriate name for church, New Life Anglican. We can point them to the new life, the freedom they can have in knowing Jesus, the experience and experience the difference he makes. Now, Paul wraps this section up with a a, a tone of absolute celebration. For through the law, I died to the law. In other words, I stopped trying to base my life on what I did so that I might live for God. I have been crucified by, with Christ. That is, I've put to death my old sinful nature and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in my body, I live by faith in the Son of God. And get this, who loved me and who gave himself for me. And I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. These verses, they're, they're, wow. And see how it highlights, how these verses highlight the importance of keeping your focus on Jesus. Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. We are now free to live. We are free, really free to live. We live without fear. We live without guilt. We have peace. We have sure, confident hope. I no longer live trying to follow burdensome rules which weigh me down. I live by faith and trust in Jesus. I live by faith in what Jesus has done. His extraordinary grace, which I did not deserve, but yet Jesus who loved me and laid down his life for me. And I live by faith in what Jesus has promised. Again, I've got to ask, do you know these truths? If not, again, chat with me or Mark. See, this is why being a Christian is so life-transforming, so liberating. The faith that saves is never faith in myself. The faith that saves is never faith in myself. It is always faith in Jesus. So as I pray and we finish up, I'll pray that God will help us to know and live out these magnificent truths more and more and that he will enable us to keep our focus on Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. I'll, uh, I'll lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we know how in life there are so many distractions that can cause us to take our eyes off Jesus. Fear, pride, lack of humility. Please forgive us for those times when we do forget who Jesus is and what he has done for us. We thank you so much for Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. And we pray that in response to your amazing grace, 
that you would please help us to live lives that are in truth, with, in line with the truth of the gospel, lives that bring honour and glory to Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing about being a new creation. I will sing because my Savior loves me. I know it's true. I'm adopted into a life of promise. I've been made new. Great is your name across your world. We give thanks to you, O God, for you are good. Your love is unstoppable. Thank you for bringing so many folk in this district to trust Jesus as Lord. Thank you, Father God, for sending your son Jesus to this planet. Thank you that Jesus was crucified for us, for our sin, for our rebellion. O oh Lord, it is awesome to reflect that for those of us who trust in Jesus as Saviour, we can say with the Apostle Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. 
and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Father God, this is awesome news. Lord, we thank you that we've heard that from the gospel this morning. But Lord, we confess that we so frequently live by faith in our own good works. We so frequently choose to ignore you. We often choose to deliberately do the opposite of what pleases you. Thank you, Father, that you've said in the scriptures that when we confess our sin, you are faithful, you are just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is awesome, Lord. Thank you. Give us grace, Lord, to forgive others for the harm they do to us in the same measure as you have forgiven us. Lord, we thank you for John Lavender and his ministry. Lord, we pray for those who live in this district and we pray that many will listen to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and place their trust in him and him alone. Help us, Lord, to pray for others and to look out for ways to share Jesus with them. Lord, we thank you for Alpha. Please bless those who are seeking truth in the midst of their difficult circumstances. Comfort those who grieve for the death of loved ones. Lord, we hold Glenn Tavner before you today. Sustain him as he grieves the death of his dad a few days ago. Sustain those who are distressed in all sorts of ways. And may each one know the love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, we pray for those who were once regular in gathering with us on Sundays and who seem now to be absent. We pray that you'll stir them up. Let each of us consider how we may stir one another up towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more because Jesus is coming soon. Father God, we pray for this nation. We pray for our elected leaders. We pray for those appointed in public service. We pray that you'll give grace to them, give them wisdom to make the decisions that look out for the best interests of all of us in this country. Father God, we pray for the children who live in this district. We pray your blessing on playtime on Thursday mornings. And Lord, we pray that you'll raise up more people from our our congregations to support and assist, not only in prayer, Lord, but actually turning up uh, and enabling connections with so many young parents and their children. Father God, we thank you for scripture uh, in schools. We pray for the lessons that so many of our people do there at Marsden Park and Northbourne Public Schools. We pray, your Lord, that you'll bless uh, these children at school and at playtime and their parents and carers. May the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ touch the hearts and minds of each of these families that we care for. Thank you, Father, for the children who gather here on Sundays. Bless those who teach them. Lord, we pray that you'll continue to build your church. Father God, thank you for the opportunity we have of enjoying lunch together here next Sunday. May those gathering, these gathering opportunities enable us to grow in love for you and to love and care one another. Father God, we bring all our thoughts and prayers to you now in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Thank you, Alan. Uh, Just before we go out to uh, morning tea, I've just got a, a few announcements. And actually, the first announcement... Uh, it isn't on the screen, but um, I am going on long service leave. Uh, oh, oh, thank you. Um, yes, I've done ministry for over 10 years, uh, and that's not, um, starting in two weeks' time. So this is my second last week for long service leave. But the fantastic thing is you have Alan looking after us, and you have Bonnie Ann and you have Adam, and you have a whole lot of very helpful people. So you get rid of the unhelpful one for a few weeks and get the really helpful one. So just thought I'd better tell you that. 
Um, and if you want to talk to me before I go, that's fine. Uh, just thought I'd better inform the congregation of that. Uh, what else is happening? Well, uh, this afternoon, uh, it, it might affect some of your friends or family members, but uh, we're restarting our 5 p.m. Oh, sorry, our 4 p.m. service at 5 p.m. Uh, so that's a wonderful thing. Uh, pretty much what we've found is lots of people wanted to move the service a bit later uh, and also the gap between this morning service and the afternoon service is really, really short if you want to do anything in between, especially if you're me or Glenn today who's uh, doing two services or others that do services. So uh, it's found it much better to move it a bit later and that might allow also other people to come because actually people are still doing activities at like four o'clock in the afternoon, as I've found out. So uh, if you've got friends or family members that aren't going to church and might be interested in a later service, uh, 5 p.m. still have kids' church. It still has lots of things that we do here. Uh, you're very much welcome to invite them along. And as Alan prayed, which is really awesome, is we're a church family here. And next week, we're going to get together and have a wonderful lunch after church. So uh, a bit more than what we usually do at morning tea. So please hang around and enjoy lunch and fellowship together. And everyone's invited. And if you want to find out a bit more information, well, you can talk to Mary about that. Um, that, that would be awesome. And lastly, friends, uh, we're so thankful for the people who give generously to our church and the mission of our church. And uh, they give that, do, do their offering through many ways. Uh, you can see the electronic options on the screen there, but there's also a wonderful letterbox at the front there, if you're or at the welcome desk, I should say, if you're someone who likes to worship by giving in cash. Uh, friends, thank you for joining us. What is it a wonderful message today to hear about what the gospel is really like? Uh, and, and as we know, uh, I, I'm sort of reflecting that it's strange that rules and regulations can actually take us away from focusing on Jesus. Like it's just a weird concept, right? You look at the Ten Commandments, you try and keep them, well, you sort of fail. And John gave that example. But if you look to Jesus and how God communicates Jesus to us through his word and by his spirit, then actually that's the way to eternal life and not just eternal life, but life now as well. So friends, uh, if you need to know more about the wonderful gospel that tells us that Jesus died for our sins and he rose again, please talk to me, John, uh, or, anyone, or one of your Christian friends after the service. That would be fantastic. Let me pray before we open up that roller door and we'll have a fantastic morning tea together. Father God, we just want to thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your gospel where we meet Jesus the truth, the one that offers us rescue from our sins through his death on the cross. Lord, we're so thankful that Jesus has uh, done all that he's done for us. Uh, so we don't have to do. All we need to do is trust in him. And we just thank you for your perfect plan for salvation. And you allow us to partake in that through trusting in Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.